66 million years ago, a giant meteorite crashed into our planet and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. This was the last of the big five mass extinctions, but this is the only one that we can bring down to a single day. When the meteorite struck into the Yucatan Peninsula and vaporized on impact. It fired infrared radiation across the surface of the planet, killing everything in its path. After the tsunamis and wildfires settled down, the soot and dust stuck around for much longer, blocking the warm rays of the sun and ushering our whole planet into a nuclear winter that lasted for several decades at least. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, and I delve into the lives of extinct animals with backbones. You know, like dinosaurs. And to study the extinction of the dinosaurs, I studied fishes. Fishes that died on the day that the meteorite struck that killed the dinosaurs. They died with impact materials in their gills as they were buried alive by an enormous wave. I excavated these fishes and studied their bones. These bones, they grow similar to tree rings, adding a new layer every year. Good years lead to thick rings, and bad years produce thin rings. And inside these yearly growth rings, you find four seasons. I used isotope geochemistry to study the bone composition. You can think of this as a record of when the animal eats and osteohistology to study the bone cell distribution. You can think of this as a record of when the animal grows. And I combined these records to reconstruct the seasonality of their growth. This gave a clear pattern. The fish ate a little bit in spring and started to grow. They ate most in summer and growth peaked. In autumn, growth slowed down. And in winter, there was no food and they didn't grow at all. Now, all these fishes died at the same time, within an hour of the meteorite impact. And their bones all gave the same pattern. They had just started to eat and grow again. So it was spring. 66 million years ago, the meteorite struck in spring. This was so exciting. Suddenly, we knew the season of the last mass extinction. It, it could help explain how the dinosaurs had gone extinct so abruptly and so selectively. And spring in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, means autumn in the Southern Hemisphere, which may explain why the recovery was twice as fast in the Southern Hemisphere. Imagine going to nuclear winter from autumn or from spring, which is devastating. Because this was so exciting, my co-authors and I submitted our research to the prestigious journal Nature. It took six months of rigorous peer review, where four external experts were asked to check our work before our paper was finally accepted. We were thrilled. When it comes to scientific publishing, nature is as good as it gets. And our paper was going to get published in a few weeks. So we celebrated as if we were nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> Two days later, we saw that a former collaborator and his team had published the same story in a different journal. I felt absolutely destroyed. But, but then I had a closer look, and my disappointment made room for outrage. The other study had no data to support its claims, and it was riddled with mistakes up to the title. The isotopic graphs were oddly perfect and looked as if every fish ate exactly the same amount every year. 
and, and grew only in summer to then immediately fall back to a winter without food. Exactly the same way every year in every fish. And there was no data. There was something fishy about this. <laughs> and because I did the analyses and I knew what the data should look like, I knew it was my responsibility to blow the whistle. I knew I had to stand up and do something. My supervisor and I pushed for transparency and requested the data again and again and again. After almost a year of getting no response, we went public with our concerns. We had to take a stand. And why is it important to stand up for science? Because science denial is rampant. 1% of Americans think the Earth is flat. Vaccines are believed to have microchips in them. And climate change, you know, that's threatening our whole existence on this planet, is dismissed as a hoax. And people actually died because they thought COVID-19 wasn't real. The first step to increasing the public trust in science is to ensure that it is true and supported by data. Distrust has real consequences for everyone. And this next mass extinction will affect our species too. From this experience, I learned that being a researcher means more than doing research and publishing papers. It also takes the backbone to check the work of others and to call out misconduct when you see it. I was made to feel like this was my fault. Even those closest to me suggested it's best to keep quiet. But once I spoke up, I was flooded with support. And I found out that my experience was just the tip of the iceberg. Now, these sort of things happen everywhere. Someone copies your work in school. Or a colleague presents someone else's idea at a meeting. Sadly, there are always going to be people who think they can get away with lying, stealing, harassment, or worse. So what can we do? If you see it happen around you, don't be a bystander. Speak up directly or file a report. If it happens to you, I'm so sorry. It is not your fault. Seek help from colleagues or an ombudsman. There is always support. And remember, they are the only ones who benefit from silence. As I continue my studies on extinct animals and extinctions, I hope to inspire others to strive for transparency and integrity. And to help out others when it's necessary. Only the truth can help prevent the next mass extinction. Only the truth can help prevent our extinction. Show your backbone. <laughs>